Welcome, thank you very much. Um, okay, yeah, so I'm going to um, try and do a whistle-stop tour of um, what normally takes about two days to actually come and have a look around our farm. So uh, without further ado, I'm not going not gonna <laughs> to dwell on the opening slide. Um, one thing about regenerative agriculture, from my point of view, is it goes to so, so much more than just the soil, so much more than just my farm, so much more than profitability. Um, we're, we're starting to do uh, community scale things. We believe, firmly believe on a regenerative farm and a regenerative system where we're regenerating our community. We bring most of the village back onto the farm. We've opened a brewery, we've opened a fermentary, we've opened a village shop. We've got a glamp site, we do farm tours, farm walks. We encourage members of the public to take five new walks we've opened, whether that's for peace, for nature, for cardiovascular, or for even an art trail that we've opened. So we're, we're, we're really engaging with our local community, and me personally firmly believes that actually um, regenerating communities is, is as important as regenerating a farm. Okay, so um, I think we can all pretty much um, realize um, how, I think the number's at the bottom. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm, I'm an Apple Mac user, and, I, and um, I send my presentations to people, and as you can see, the year 8, 2013, we haven't had yet. Um, <laughs> it's coming. Um, so I, I will apologize now because PowerPoint, unfortunately, doesn't like Keynote, and I presume this is why it's been converted. That said, it's, it's a, basic, a basic diagram, and it's showing 70 years up until the year 2000, we had, I think it was 12 anomalies in weather, whether excessively dry or excessively wet. From 2000 to 2022, uh, we've now had seven, 17 anomalies. The climate is definitely changing, it's becoming a problem. I mean, I'm very thankful our next door neighbors kept records since 1930 um, and, um, and shares them with me every year. What do you think, what's causing these problems? Photograph I took, simply showing overgrazing up in the Welsh hills. This, this is feeding our catchment. We get some serious weather events these days, and unfortunately, it makes it so fast to our um, catchment that it causes massive problems. Flood hydrograph. After Storm Dennis, the, the likes we'd never seen, we are seeing huge peaks, huge troughs, and if you see how vertical they all are, Unfortunately, the rain is getting, and the water is getting to our, to our river catchment far too fast. I ask this question an awful lot. Unfortunately, what I consider the government's process of telling us we should eat, be eating five a day, generally our, our food associated with our five a day, the salad, the fruit, the veg, is some of the most intensive and soil destructive um, crops we grow. Um, what I often say to people is we have these grade one soils getting a grade five treatment and it's a real problem. Even worse than that, and the video probably won't play. No, don't be silly. Um, this is a video um, just showing at the bottom of our road where um, salads are grown and it's actually getting a more and more regular, regular um, thing to, to photograph um, on, the, uh, on the road down there. It's, it's rather quite tragic. Um, so that was in the box, but, you know, it doesn't matter. It's only PowerPoint. <laughs> this, is, this is fantastic. Okay. Taking ownership, the reality of Times on Farm. The real, reality of Times on Farm is exactly that. Everything we think we're going to get right, we just get slightly wrong. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> but interestingly enough, my father planted a hedge in 1974. Um, and um, up until 1997... Uh, we saw a fair bit of erosion, and uh, in 1997, I applied to get into the um, higher-level stewardship scheme and uh, put in a four-metre grass margin. And by 2012, we de decided to extend the grass margin by two more metres. And even up to 2016, we realised that things were still getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, we work with the Environment Agency these days, do things a little bit differently than we have done since 1974. Um, they estimated we've lost 400,000 tonnes of topsoil off this field alone. If I'm going to leave my children anything, 
And bearing in mind as a farmer, the only thing I consider something I own is soil. Giving them bedrock is probably not a very great asset to give them. I ask this question to nearly everybody, and it's the title of a book I'm writing at the moment. What we've started to see, and what we've really, really started to understand, we're using more and more and more products. Yields plateaued in 1990. We're 32 years on from the yield plateau, and yet the cost of growing that yield is just ever increasing. Cost of fertilizer, cost of diesel, the resistance of, of, of pest, weeds, diseases, requiring more and more and more inputs. And it got to the stage at Townsend where I realized I was a total moron and things had to change. Uh, and interesting enough, the Canadian graph up in the top right is very much mimicked for any agricultural industry across the world. Those that are supplying agriculture seem to be making an awful lot of money out of us. And those of us that are farmers don't seem to be making a huge amount at all. The other thing we started to realize was pests colonize a vacuum. I don't know, I say we started to realize, I mean, um, Aristotle came up with this phrase, um, nature adores a vacuum. Um, he was around a while ago now, wasn't he? What we started to realize is actually the more things we were killing, it was actually selecting for the very things we were trying to kill to, 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 to recolonize. And therefore, creating a vacuum over and over and over again was actually selecting for our weeds, pests, and diseases to get worse and worse and worse. Exposing them to that pesticide or that fertilizer or whatever we were exposing them to, is there any reason, any wonder why we're actually driving resistance and things like that? So that's a massive problem and something we have to consider. I ask a question to a lot of people, what's so important about a healthy soil? These photographs were taken within 12 meters of each other. First, first top left was over the hedge. On the right-hand side was in the field, and in the bottom was the bottom of the hedge. It's amazing what you can do with soil and how soils react to what you do to them. I'm going to give you a brief example of the importance of soil and the importance of soil health with this little diagrammatic. So we look at this and we think, how does a healthy plant soil actually, how should they function? Okay, we have lots of microbes in our soil. They are all breathing in oxygen, respiring carbon dioxide. That's rather quite important because this carbon dioxide mixes with water in our soil and it forms carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is really quite useful at stripping phosphate and potassium as well as other minerals, and putting them in a solution in which our soil microbes can actually extract them. Oh my God, he's put the moon up. Shall I put my sandals on as well? The, the moon has an amazing effect on our soil. And I'm not going to start talking about a waxing and waning moon. It's okay. The moon has the same effect on our soil as it does on our oceans. It pulls and pushes water. Twice a day, the moon does something in a healthy soil that it can't do in an unhealthy soil. It pulls soil moisture upwards. If you've got a compacted layer, this will not happen. And why is this important? Well, funny enough, lots of the CO2 in our soil surface is then pulled out. Why is that so important? Ever considered why the stomata of every single plant on planet Earth is on the underside of a leaf? Half a billion years of evolution, half a billion years of making things simple, would suggest that actually there's six times more CO2 oozing out of a healthy soil surface than there is in our atmosphere. If you're a plant and you're driving efficiency, why wouldn't you capture it out of the soil surface? Sudden silence. The moon goes away and rushes into our soil, oxygen, 78% um, nitrogen, 21% oxygen in our atmosphere. It's rather quite nicely balanced, isn't it? 21% oxygen going back to feed all those microbes that are trying to respire. 78% of that is nitrogen. Don't we spend a fortune on nitrogen every year? It's odd, isn't it, that um, we have 35,000 tonnes of nitrogen above every hectare 
of agriculture, or not agriculture, but every hectare of land across planet Earth. And yet we seem to re require the Harbour Bosch process. So what do we do at Townsend? Well, um, lots of people ask me what is the definition of regenerative farming. And after I'd written about 13 sides of notes and, and trying to explain to them as simply as I possibly could, I came up with actually the opposite. And I said that what we do, do at Townsend is try and replace everything with death with life. Competitive exclusion. We, we, we try and harvest the sun's energy. We try and do anything to support life on the farm. And once you have life on the farm, funny enough, things become a little bit easier. I talk about this an awful lot, farming with your eyes. And I take people to this field quite a lot because I'm quite proud of this. And I say, which field do you want of grass? And I'm sure most of you are already looking at the left-hand side thinking, that's awesome. Nice field of green lush grass. Interesting when you look at a different, slightly different angle and realize how much grass is on that left-hand field and how much clover and actual herbal lay that was on the right-hand side. And therefore, it's so important for me to tell other people, for goodness sake, stop using just one perspective. Start having a look, different things, different, 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 different ideas, and just keep your eyes open. And I... And as I say to a lot of people, um, don't go and buy a Horizon Joel straight away. <laughs> Not straight away. No, we, we need to start using spades a lot more as farmers. It's the thing, as I said, it's the thing we own the asset. You ask any farmer, do they own a spade? They generally go to the garden shed because that's where they use it in the garden when they ever get time to do a bit of gardening. The fact that there aren't a spade in the, every single tractor and every single truck, in actual fact, for those that are tractor manufacturers, wouldn't it be beautiful if there was an automatic spade holder on every single tractor produced? <laughs> but it's very true. You know, a spade is a simple tool, but it can tell you so much about your soil. So I've got to just run through the five principles of soil health, and this is um, something that um, I hold dear to what we do. It's a photograph I took in Australia um, in the background and just goes to show the importance of just a single plant and single root. Living roots. It's really important that we maintain a living root. If we have living roots, we have um, photosynthesis occurring. If we have photosynthesis occurring, that means we have sugar being produced. If we have sugar being produced, they are feeding the microbes in our soil. If they are feeding the microbes in our soil, in return, they are bringing nutrients to the plant. The plant is able to grow a bit more, bigger solar panel, more sugar. Living roots, vital. Limited disturbance is a real problem for me because most farmers get to the very first two words and go and buy a horizon drill. Limit mechanical disturbance. The worry is they go and buy a George Sly drill, and then they carry on stacking huge amounts of herbicides, huge amounts of fungicides, huge amounts of insecticides, and every other side you can ever come up with, plaster it in ammonium nitrate, and then wonder why their soils are actually going backwards. They bought the drill, they're, they're limiting their disturbance. You do more disturbance with ivermectin, you do more disturbance with with sheep wormers, with, with sheep fly spray, with, with, with all the things, the sides are more damaging to the soil than anything that you'll pull through it. Well, I say anything within reason. It's really important that when we look at reducing and limiting disturbance, we do it balanced. If you're going to buy a Horizon drill, make sure you have earned the right to use it. I firmly believe when somebody goes and buys a new drill, they should come with an agronomist that can actually tell them, we've had this conversation, that can actually tell them whether they should go and buy it. The worst thing George wants, really, is somebody saying, that, George, that, that, that drill's rubbish. Didn't work for me. Well, that's probably because your soil was nowhere near ready for accepting that drill. Armour. Mother Nature goes well out of her way to make sure her soil is covered at all times. Your driveway, your patio, 
your patio cracks and up come the dandelions and, and all sorts of plantains and all sorts of things come up because Mother Nature spends all her time making sure she has a coating over her soil. We spend most of that time either removing it with glyphosate or some other pesticide or just hand weeding. Funny enough, if we're going to remove it, we need to replace it. Diversity, really important. You only go to a verge side this middle of this summer and the most of the verge sides were still green. You look over the hedge of a grass field and it was brown. Simple diversity, the interaction of different plant roots, limited disturbance and every other part of regenerative agriculture was going to work on those verge sides. You look over the hedge, things were very different. Integration of animals. This is a struggle for most, but it's really important that we actually bring animals back onto mixed farming systems and understand that nowhere in nature have soils and plants and ecosystems are devoid in animals. It's really important that we use the two together. So let's expand a little bit on that, living roots. That is the root exudate of 12 wheat plants in 14 days, freeze dried. It's quite a lot. I think it's a lot. Okay. And like I said, it's carbon rich amino acids. If you want to put carbon in the soil, use plants. And like I said, all, this, all that feeds underground biology, really important. This is controversial. Everybody is a livestock farmer. Most of your livestock's invisible. Certainly should be. You would never have a day off from feeding those livestock above ground. Therefore, we should never have a day off from feeding it underground. Because it's really poor, important for soil um, that we have those underground microbes. And you know how many microbes are in, in a teaspoon of soil, of healthy soil, yeah? Seven billion microbes in a teaspoon? It's a lot. And if you actually add up all the, all the microbes in my own soil back at the farm, it comes to five cows a hectare in weight, which according to DEFRA is overstocked. But in order of preference of food, like I said, they love those living root exudates. That's the most important. If they can't get that, they start eating the dead plant roots. Anybody that goes into a field of stubble right now, it's got nothing else there, and you pick up the stubble, it, it just comes up in your hand. All the microbes have eaten the roots. If there's no cover crop or nothing else in that field, funny enough, what are they going to eat after that? Well, they start looking at the crop residue. When the crop residue disappears, and that's generally by December, they live and feast on one thing and one thing only, and that's the organic matters in your soil. They'll actually eat the house in which they live. Simple picture of a cute young man. <laughs> I'm not allowed to say that, am I? <laughs> no. Now, I mean, it just shows, goes to show how important the living roots are. You can see this photograph was taken four weeks ago. And you can see how much the microbes have already eaten that, that stubble on the right-hand side. And yet how much rooting is on the, on the, um, the left-hand side. We grow some asparagus. We grow up a farm shop. Asparagus has a bit of a reputation, and rightly so. And to produce asparagus, you've got to start thinking a little bit outside the box, along with a lot of other things. This is what our asparagus beds look like in the spring, interrowed with wildflowers. That's what our neighbor's asparagus look like on the same day. I know which asparagus I'd pick to eat, and I think the consumers should be given the opportunity to choose as well. The slight issue with doing these sort of things is technology is a little bit behind. Thankfully, my wife isn't, and she's, she's as cool as anything. <laughs> and um, we run a lot of experiments at the farm, and there's Helen, lover, um, with a mower, going up between the rows, 
and just making sure the evidence um, cut just before the asparagus comes through and the clover understory is, is just there hugging the, hugging the ground. In the bottom picture is something I keep nagging Mr. Sly to build for me. Anywhere? No, 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 no. So I'd love a tractor-mounted Romo to, to, to take over. Hel oh, Helen would love a tractor-mounted Romo, shall I say. <laughs> <laughs> um, we tried all sorts. We bought six haters like that and, and put it on a bar. Started them all up, put it on the back of a massive 135 tractor, and I got halfway down the field, and I'd blown six, four of them up um, and buried two in the soil. So that didn't work. Um, a lot of effort, a lot of experimenting. But things like Romos are going to become more and more important as we look to actually keep this green leaf, this living mulch, this ground armoured, soil roots, and everything else that we need to do is something that's going to become more and more important. We'd now, of course, lamb in September. Why wouldn't you? Um, and um, that's when we have most food on the farm. When you start growing cover crops, when you start growing understory clovers, when you, when you start realising, in actual fact, the abundance of food for livestock is actually September, October, November, December, when you have all this food available, it makes sense to start lambing at a different time of the year. Limited disturbance, of course. Oh, this video works. How fortunate. Good drill, that. <laughs> do you know what? Tragically, I have more clients with, <laughs> with Horizon drills than I do anything else. But I put that one in especially for, for George. And it's really important, this technology is starting to become more and more important and, and, and getting really much so. Um, and I'm, I'm glad Kit's here um, and the small robot company doing some really great stuff because I do believe technology and all of, the, all of this really interesting robotics and sensing is going to be the, the, the massive solution to some of the problems I'm facing. You know, we still use some agrochemical, but wouldn't it be wonderful as that top top left um, weed it shows as it's driving it detects immediately anything green and can just give it a squirt rather than spraying the whole, whole soil surface along with inter-row hose and everything that goes with it. Armour of course, really quite simple, bare soil, it's 44.6 degrees. At that temperature there's hardly any soil microbes that can survive that. By the time you get to the mulch at 20, is it 28 or 20, yeah, 28 degrees, that's actually a, a pretty decent temperature for soil microbes to be in their optimum breeding. The earthworms, they're quite important. 25711, we know this. Albert Howard did this work. What goes into an earthworm compared to what comes out of an earthworm? Two times the amount of humus. Five times the amount of um, nitrogen, seven times the amount of potassium, eleven times the amount of um, sorry phosphate, eleven times the amount of potassium. That's rather quite useful. By doing this soil, looking after mulching, by, by using crimpers, by using soil amendments, it all ha massively helps to creating natural, cheap fertilizer for my farm. Diversity, you can't get simpler than that. Why on earth are we not getting every variety we possibly can, mixing them up together and planting them? There's a reason we're not all stood here dead. Well, perhaps you are. <laughs> Good God, this is hard on you, isn't it? <laughs> COVID, thankfully, didn't wipe us all out. Only that, that, those guys over there. The, the rest of us are all right. No. Why? Because we have diversity within our genetics. Absolutely critical. So if you use that and take it to a field and you think they go and plant trillions upon trillions of clones and wonder why they get disease ripping through, you can just liken it to COVID. When you put 144 varieties in, funny enough, it doesn't jump about anything like it does when you plant clones. It's a really simple, really simple way 
of growing wheat and adding diversity. A little bit more diversity. Boats, beans and oats. Fantastic break crop. Great diversity. And funny enough, Darwin came up with this theory quite a while ago. He was quite a clever bloke, and so I read. Um, but the, the, the combination of adding two things would always outyield the individual of each, each one. We get about 126% yield when we combine beans and oats. That's rather quite useful from a bank manager. The same with our herbal lays. No idea where I put a seed. seed. <laughs> and now I've clicked this about a thousand times. I oh, know it's working. Um, ah, the top video is not working. That's where is it? Ah, we grow potatoes slightly differently. I don't know whether you can see the companion crop dropping in with the potatoes. They're planted with peas, vetch, and buckwheat. That's really quite important. They fix nitrogen, they solubilize phosphate, they use atmospheric nitrogen, they have pre-nectarase inflorescence. In other words, they actually ooze nectarine from their stem before they flower, therefore bringing in lots and lots of beneficials that would feast on our peach potato aphid that is now so resistant as barely an insecticide available that will kill it. So well, we try and use parasitic wasps, lace wings and anything else, ladybirds rather quite useful. We ridge instead of use herbicides. Ridging potato crops is, is something funny enough that was invented a long, long time ago. And down the bottom here, I wasn't going to talk about it for long, but it's our compost extract. We actually produce four different types, types of compost back at home. We, we produce a Bakashi compost, which is an anaerobic compost. And that is what we do on large scale when we have large scale manures we use an anaerobic process for that. For aerobic compost, the main one we use is a Johnson Sioux bioreactor developed by Dr. David Johnson and his wife Sue. But that's his surname. I don't even you know, I don't, yeah. <laughs> anyway. And we take that, um, we make this biological compost in this Johnson Sioux. We analyze it with, with a couple of things. I use a microscope first and foremost, um, and I also send it off for a PLFA um, to check on uh, how much life is in there. We're, we're creating about 14 trillion microbes in a teaspoon. So you can imagine that's um, so potent in actual fat, no plant can grow in it, which is why obviously on my compost pile we end up with no plants. We then extract it through water, give it some fish, hydrolysate, we give it some molasses, so two different food types, and then we apply it around the tuber. So about, essentially we do some dip damage to the soil, we then repair as much as we possibly can by sticking as much biology for competitive exclusion in and around the tube of the potato. Funny enough, our disease, rhizoctonias and things like that disappear, our skin finish totally improves, we haven't used any um, nematicides now for 11 years. We, it solubilizes huge amounts of phosphate. I, I live and farm in the Y Valley. Um, I'm sure you've probably heard of a bit of a phosphate issue going on down there. It's, it's dire, yet my neighbors on potatoes will be still putting on 300 kilos of phosphate to grow a potato crop because RBO 209 allows you to. Um, we, we don't use any. We don't need to. It's another cost. So these microbes are doing some phenomenal amount of work for us. They, all, the, all this nutrition, our potatoes last year were growing on 30 kilos of nitrogen, no phosphate at all, and 80 kilos of potassium, which is about a tenth of what most, most main crop potatoes are grown on. And because we're not force feeding it all this... Um, Salt fertilizer, funny enough, irrigation requirement drops massively. And so, do, so does um, plant disease, blight sprays. Blight spray on our main crop potatoes last year received one blight spray. Next door neighbor put 12. Integration of livestock is rather quite important. More important is this beautiful invention here. These mobile cattle crush 
Without that, me and my wife were, were, were kind of falling out at times when we were trying to TB cattle um, with a couple of gates and a bale of twine. Um, so it just goes to show, in actual fact, what technology is doing and that the, these new cattle crushes that we can actually use are absolutely phenomenal. But more importantly, um, the wrapper, electric fence winder and unwinder is another great invention that we use time and time again. These are our cover crops. They probably look very different than most because on the, right, on the left hand side is where we have grazed. We've just moved our sheep out of there and we're moving them on to the right. Because I work on the premise, if we're going to actually create our soil, then why don't we just leave a little bit for the soil to overwinter? That's a bit of armor, a bit of living root, and a little bit of um, and diversity and um, I've, forgot, I've, I've forgotten now. <laughs> I've forgotten my main five principles that I live to. <laughs> it's dreadful, isn't it? Yeah. No, and, lim and obviously limited disturbance. So, so the so the soil, soil stays where it is, and our sheep do rather quite well on it. Funny enough. Most sheep farmers that used to bring tax sheep to us always told us that sheep were born to die. Give them a ring when they're dead and they'll come and pick them up. I thought that was odd because most animals really aren't born to die. And then you realize when you feed them mud, they start to die. And I think there's a correlation between dying and the amount of mud you're feeding them. But we'll see. Diversity of the flood. This is our flood. Um... That's a flock and a herd, of course. Um, yeah. This actually works brilliantly well. We normally have pigs in there as well all summer. We run all our livestock in one giant flood. Um, we, we do daily moves so that they don't overgraze. We don't have a worm burden. Um, and believe it or not, they all get on very well. Never, never had any problems. Um, and not being livestock farmers by, by, by trade, shall I say, um, I do ask livestock farmers what they do all day. Um, so this is our flirt. Just imagine, we, 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 just imagine we open the gate in the morning, they all walk past us. Every, every animal we own walks past us, demonstrating their health. Okay? And then when they walk past us, we close the gate. What else do I do for the day? So it is. It, it's, it's amazing when I look at livestock farmers that jump in a truck all day long and go and look at 20 sheep in that field, 10 cows over there, and then they've got to go 18 more miles to go and have a look at another. And actually all they're doing is truck driving all day. You're not a livestock farmer. So I think it's a really clever way of put, getting the animals to, to demonstrate their health to me. Because the other thing they do is stand on the gate and have a look down the field and try and see if they can see anything that doesn't look healthy. So, like I said, we just turn things on its head a bit. And of course, if they don't walk past us, the chances are there is something wrong with them and we do need to do, do some kind of intervention. Normally, shoot them. <laughs> no. We do have a hard cull policy, but we don't just shoot to kill. We, um, we, 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 we don't use insecticides um, at, at home purely because we don't need to. If I identified a horrific insect problem, and this is the reason why I'm regenerative, not organic, if I identified a horrific aphid problem, I would use an insecticide. I cannot afford to just let my crop go from a 10 ton a hectare potential winter wheat to three. I think it's dangerous. I also think it's rather quite dangerous to start using some of the regenerative pesticide-free insecticides because they have absolutely been not tested on anything, diatomaceous earth, spreading that all around our countryside, is rather quite odd when you consider, when you look under a microscope, of which I look at, as, as you know, on microbes, it looks like billions and billions of shards of glass. The reason diatomaceous earth was used in grain to ki kill flower mites is because it physically scratched their skin to the point of death. I don't particularly want that in my soil. The other thing to bear in mind is, after speaking to the um, insect specialists at Rothamsted, half our beneficials, of course, are resistant to our pyrethroids. So sometimes we can get carried away by using the wrong things. 
with Jones with Mays. Um, this is this is George Slice. <laughs> That's his, that was his best field. That's the only one he let me take a photograph of. <laughs> Just messing. It's worse than that. Um, <laughs> But um, we look at regenerating maize, uh, re re uh, regenerative maize, and interestingly enough, a lot of people these days, and they're doing some really good stuff, and they're drilling maize and then planting grass between it. And then we took it to the next stage, of course, and wondered why we were actually um, taking the original grass field out. So, of course, we now cut a, 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 a field for silage. We then direct drill the maize in between with a direct drill in Missouri. Interesting enough, the first year we sprayed it off with glyphosate and then realized actually there was, it was a symbiotic relationship between the grass and the maize, so we don't even spray it off with glyphosate anymore. It works an absolute treat. And as you can see on here, planted the same day into a typical knobbly seed bed, still waiting for emergence. A lot of people ask me, oh goodness knows if this is going to work, a bit of proof, because unfortunately... The science behind regenerative farming is so complex, I really pity those that are trying to really nail down these multi, massive multi ideas and, and, and put some science behind them. And it's really, really hard. So that's just one of, the, one of the things that's happening on our farm. We have lots of people. We have the Environment Agency doing, um, been filming our farm, and we'll film it for another five years. Um, literally, photograph is taken every, I think, 30 seconds just to watch. They asked me to continue to, to farm in a way that would erode the soil, and then they've now said, after three years, now start trying to build soil. So it's a really interesting experiment ongoing. University of Cambridge do lots of work with us, um, University of Lincoln, University of Leeds, um, and the University of Sheffield. So we have quite a lot of um, things ongoing um, and quite a lot of, 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 of building of knowledge, should I say. This is, um, this is the stream that leaves our farm. Um, that's where our farm enters the stream after a heavy rainfall. My neighbours don't grow any veg. And my argument was always, in actual fact, we don't need to destroy our soils, even when we're producing veg. We just have to try a little bit harder. There's lots we can do, and there's lots of improvements we can make. And funny enough, profitability, which is something most, most important to me, um, is driven purely by what I'm seeing and what I'm learning. One thing that is going to happen on farm, we're going to have a debate in the Oxford Farming Conference about this. I can't wait because I'm taking on Kip. Um, so um, that will be a bit of fun. But for us on our farm, human integration is something that we're actually applying more and more. I think these are my daughters and my wife, yeah. But, pardon? I, well, I can't actually. Oh, yeah, I should look here. <laughs> yeah, I'm married to one of them. Yeah, um, our, we, we, we firmly believe in family farms. And when I talk to people about a family farm, that is not just posing for some photographs like they are here. They are fully involved. What I want as a family farm is for everybody to do their fair share, everybody to be part of the business. It's not about the, 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 the farmer, be that the man or the woman, going and do the farming and everyone else sat around in the kitchen waiting for, to see what they're going to come and do. This is our agroforestry um, project that we're planting at the moment. 
Um, we planted olive trees, of course. Why wouldn't you? You know, because my great-grandchildren, I believe, are going to be harvesting olives. Um, my grandfather planted um, vineyard um, for, for us. Um, we, we produce eight, eight and a half thousand bottles off 0.8 of a hectare. Um, some of the finest sparkling wine in, in the world. Sometimes you've just got to think a little bit ahead. Um, and there's my wife and, and da eldest daughter planting our tea plantation, of course. Why wouldn't you grow tea? Um, I mean, that's all my wife ever drinks. Um, so it's, I think it's probably better that we actually start producing our own. So that's a brief uh, look at our farm. I'll probably overrun. Uh, I normally do. Um, we do do lots of farm open days, lots of farm tours. Harry Henderson over there has been and bought, bought some guys to come and have a look. George won't refuse us to come and see how farming should be done. Uh, I, don't, I don't take offense to that. Um, but seriously, if, um, if you, if you want to have a, a, a trip out, um, drop me a line. Come and have a seat, see what we're doing. It's a warts and all tour. Come and see what we're doing. And it's 12 months of the year as well. Um, it's not all come in May when everything looks beautiful. You know, come in December when things don't look as bad as everybody else's. So. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>